kind of very obvious one, but it you know is very trendy in the last couple of years is uh, user generated content, right? And so instead of having like a really well polished ad, you basically have someone with an iPhone speaking direct to the phone. Uh, it's actually effective is for two uh, two things. One, uh, all of our you know social platforms we use today. Uh, it, it's basically people speaking to videos, right? That's what TikTok is. That's what Instagram is. And so when you're serving an ad in someone's feed, you want it to fit the native context, right? And so that's why UGC content works really well for ads. Welcome to the e-commerce marketing podcast, the highly rated digital marketing podcast that provides weekly digital marketing tips and strategies from some of the world's top digital marketers and e-commerce entrepreneurs that will help you take your digital marketing to the next level. Sit back and enjoy this power packed episode hosted by Arlen Robinson, who is an e-commerce entrepreneur and digital marketing expert with over 20 years of experience. Hey, e-commerce marketing podcast listener. Are you looking to increase traffic and sales to your website? You can do this by launching your own affiliate program. Just visit getosi.com and sign up for a free trial today. That's getosi.com. Now get ready to hear from your e-commerce marketing expert of the week as they drill down to give you details on marketing strategies that can help grow your business. Welcome back to the e-commerce marketing podcast, everyone. My name is Arlen and I am your host. And today we have a very special guest, Hal Smith, who's the founder of H Street Digital, which is an adept and he's an adept entrepreneur cultivating business growth through data driven digital advertising uh, focused on scaling leads and new customers for consumer brands. His leadership propels the company with triple digit growth annually and with a track record of managing over 100 million in digital advertising campaigns and a knack for objective data analysis how ensures h street digital provides brands to scale customers profitably welcome to the podcast hal awesome thanks for having me arlen oh Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to talk to you. We're going to be diving deep into your bread and butter, which is, of course, digital advertising. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the name of the game for you and what you're, uh, I guess you could say, probably knee deep in day in and day out. So I I would imagine you're quite an expert in that. So really excited to to see, uh, you know, what you have to offer. But before we get into all of that, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background and specifically how you got into what you're doing today? Yeah, so... I guess it started off uh, first job out of college was actually in uh, political advertising. So that's where I, I kind of kicked things off. Uh, it was an interesting uh, first job. Uh, I worked on a presidential campaign and it's a very unique situation, but I, I think the best thing I can say about it is uh, presidential campaign is basically the biggest playing field you can be on in terms of digital advertising. It's the biggest budget, shortest amount of time, Uh, really super high impact in terms of what you do. So uh, that was my first job and I got a lot of experience working with a lot of really smart people um, and learned a lot at at kind of the biggest scale you can do. Mm -hmm. And so after working on that, uh, you know, I worked across uh, a couple other uh, political opportunities, working for a consulting group, uh, working with uh, senatorial, senatorial, gubernatorial and congressional campaigns doing uh, advertising as well. And then I decided I was, I was pretty sick of political advertising. <laughs> so, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And then I uh, did some corporate uh, uh, advertising for a bit, working for a startup performance advertising agency. And, and there worked with a couple of big, uh, you know, Fortune 50 uh, brands. And then uh, one and started my agency in 2020, uh, had a good first year, but then got a pretty good offer by one of my clients to go in house with them. So I did that for about a year. Um, I basically learned that I, I don't like working for a boss and I don't like having a boss. And so <laughs> right, uh, right. 2022, I left it and then started up the agency again. And so since then, it's gone from just me and a laptop to now 18 people, about 10 clients. Awesome. And, and we're growing pretty fast at this point. Uh, really okay. excited about what we're doing this year. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're very focused on uh, what are called like direct to consumer companies, e-commerce mm-hmm. stores, uh, driving new customers, driving leads. So, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you for sharing that background. And, um, you know, interesting, like you said, going from the p- political advertising to what you're doing, dealing with, you know, con- uh, 
product-based companies, e-commerce companies in the consumer world. But I, I can definitely see how that political advertising was a huge, uh, I'm sure, learning experience for you and almost like a proving ground. Because like you said, they they have uh, almost, uh, you know, these days, most of these big presidential campaigns have huge budgets. And so they can throw money at just about any type of ad campaign, social media network, you name it. Um, you know, I'm sure it was a great opportunity for you to, you know, see what was working and what doesn't work. Um, so, um, yeah, good stuff. And, uh, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. Well, re with respect to digital advertising, one of the things that's, I think, on the pulse, not only for brands, but I, I'd say even consumers these days is um, privacy and data. And so over these coming next few years, how do you see digital advertising evolving with all of these privacy and data protection concerns in the forefront of people's minds? Yeah, it's a great question. It's something that I would say is probably the most important thing from a performance advertising standpoint, which is what we do because so much of this data collected uh, gave us, I mean, it gave us a lot of leverage in terms of who we're targeting, uh, you know, learning more about our customers, figuring out better audiences and, and, you know, being able to craft our creative messaging much better. And, mm -hmm. and then there's also too, it's more of the, uh, I would say more automated kind of data side of things. So, uh, you know, that the pixels, cookies, um, the lookalike modeling that we could use on these platforms before, that that all was dependent on massive amounts of data being collected about people. And so like the biggest change then was, you know, iOS 14, uh, that update, which I think happened in 2020. Uh, that was kind of the first step. And then now we have like, well, around that same time, there's like CCPA um, and all these other kind of like regulation around uh, people's like ability to delete their data from people's database and then also to like what was collected on them. So, you know, for me personally, I'm concerned because we've lost a lot of leverage in terms of audience targeting. And then also these ad platforms have gotten uh, less efficient, less smart uh, about how to target people because a lot of those data pipelines are just you know, cut or it's reduced. What does the future look like? Um, there's like a technical thing where uh, I believe a lot of brands are going to have to be much smarter and more strategic about the, how they manage their own customer data. And so that can be in a couple of ways. One is how they uh, communicate to their customers, how they're collecting their data, and then become much smarter about like what's called like in-house data management, right? And, and basically having potentially in-house data scientists to manage that themselves and not rely on third-party platforms to kind of give them access to these insights, but instead doing it themselves. Uh, that also entails like having good like email programs and, and better customer profiles themselves uh, instead of like re relying on third party data providers or these platforms like Meta to kind of provide th those insights. I think another thing is, uh, you know, what does the future look like in terms of regulation and then how much uh, these platforms have to either allow users or brands to allow users to know what data is being collected on them. And I think that's still like very, uh, it's almost like not a whole lot, not a whole lot of people know what that actually entails right now. Like currently, like with CCPA, you should be able to like message any brand or any platform and say, I want all my data that's collected on me to be deleted, right? That's right. like kind of one of the key things that's there. Uh, but what does that mean going forward? It, it's kind of messy because a lot of, these platforms is more uh, the advantage is predictive data, right? And so what does that mean too? Because like you can delete your information, but they also have these kind of predictive, you know, aspects that they're collected about you. And so it's like, do they delete like what they are predicting you might be, be able to do? Um, and then all of it's like based on like anonymized, anonymized data that's collected on you too. So, you know, there's lots of loopholes for these platforms to kind of play in. Uh, and so what is like, I don't know what the future means. It, it's really, really tough, but I, I do say that, you know, uh, for me as a performance advertiser, I'm more trying to also kind of work like the brands are to find loopholes or find ways that kind of work around this. Um, another example might be what's called like server to server, like connections where, uh, you have like a server that's owned by a brand that's like collecting data about people. And then you have the server that's like run by a platform like Facebook. And you're kind of connecting that data that works around like cookie tracking, right? 
Um, there are things like that. So I don't know. It's, it's kind of like one of those, uh, you know, uh, it's like an arms race between these platforms trying to work around regulation to be better about tracking things that are not so obvious. And then, uh, you know, regulation trying to stop them from doing that. So, I mean, I know it's like not a direct question with not a, like not a lot of specifics, but it's so hard to actually speak specific to like different changes because so much of it is changing so quickly. And it's so hard to actually understand like how these platforms are responding to it as well as how like third party data providers are responding to it and advertisers. Mm -hmm. So. Hey there, fellow entrepreneurs and B2B marketers. Before we dive back into the conversation, let me introduce you to a game changer in the lead generation arena, Lead Feeder. Now, we all know the struggle of identifying those elusive website visitors and turning them into valuable leads. But what if I told you there's a tool that not only promises, but delivers on supercharging your lead generation and sales efforts? Enter Lead Feeder. Imagine having the power to identify companies visiting your website, track their behavior in real time, and seamlessly integrate it all with your CRM. Lead Feeder is not just a tool, it's your secret weapon for efficient and targeted lead engagement. What sets Lead Feeder apart? It's the ability to provide detailed insights into customer behavior helping your sales team prioritize efforts and close deals faster. With customizable notifications, lead scoring, and GDPR compliance, Lead Feeder is changing the game. Ready to revolutionize your approach to leads and deals? Head over to leadfeeder.com for your free demo today. That's L-E-A-D-F-E-E-D-E-R.com. Don't miss out on the future of successful lead generation with Lead Feeder. Yeah, yeah, very true. It's uh, you, like you said, we're, we're still kind of at the early stage of a lot of these changes. And a lot of, um, you know, I guess, <laughs> depending on what side of the fence you're kind of pulling for, if you're on the brand side or any of the, the consumer side, uh, you know, uh, the brand's you, most of these big brands, you know, as we already know, typically can kind of get away with doing a lot of stuff kind of behind yeah. the scenes, whether it's there's regulations or not. And I don't think there's too much we can do to stop that um, from the consumer side. Yeah. You know, it's just about what are people willing to to, to give up and, um, you know, I, I guess how how many advocates are we going to be have on the side of the consumer that are going to try to you know vie for the consumer rights um these days i don't know i don't see too many um i think you know a lot of people's stance is that uh, you know yeah they know they've been marketed to yay they know these brands have my information it's i think we're at the stage that this whole data thing people are so accustomed to giving up their data and and being able to be targeted in various ways they're almost kind of used to it um in a way and so yeah, I don't, I don't know if a lot is really going to change. Well, the thing that I actually hate to hear is when people say, oh, I'm not doing anything wrong. So why would I be <laughs> right. worried about this? Right. And right, exactly. it's not it's not about you. Right. It's about how mm -hmm. invasive this has become. Right. Yeah. And so I will say, you know, my job, like what I do is kind of dependent on this data collection. And I'm more successful if, if data is more data is collected and it's more strategically like managed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. But I will say as a consumer myself, I have a VPN on my phone. I have all these ad blockers up. Like I have all these things because I know what is collected and it it concerns me, right? And so I do think there needs, you know, the consumer protection side of things, the consumer advocates, like that is extremely important, um, even though it might ultimately uh, jeopardize, you know, the success of what we're doing in terms of an agency on the performance side. but. Uh, it is really important that people do wake up to this because it's incredibly invasive uh, yeah, and it's, people are so used to it. Yeah, that's that's the thing. And and, and I, I agree with you. I, I, I do hate people who say, yeah, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't have anything to hide. But like you said, it's not really about you or you hiding anything. It's like you said, it's it's more of the fact that the, the evasiveness and the, and the fact that brands are, are getting 
uh, you know, having all of this access is is the main is the is kind of the main concern there. Yeah. Um, now, a- along with data, um, privacy concerns, kind of the next big thing in in digital advertising is AI and machine learning. You know, it's really starting to transform digital advertising strategies. We have a lot of agency owners on, and and things are changing so quickly. Um, within your agency, how, how has H Street Digital leverage you know these technologies ai and, and machine learning you know to optimize your campaign performance yeah so one the biggest way it's changed how we do things is really the how the ad platforms operate today so that's you know google ads uh generally and then meta which is facebook and instagram and TikTok. so the biggest yeah. change for us has been campaign management campaign like the tactics around how to set up campaigns how to optimize campaigns uh, that's no longer a skill. It's commoditized because these platforms know how to do this best. How it's really changed us is we're primarily focused on the inputs. So we're focused on creative that we put into these ad platforms because effectively all you're doing today is generating you know, images, videos, uh, scripts, like copy. You yeah. put it into the ad platform. You allow Meta to combine it. Uh, to find the best people to deliver the ads to and and basically optimize those campaigns itself, right? It's extremely powerful. I, I used to do a type of media buying that was, we called it, uh, you know, building in bulk. Uh, but I would go and set up campaigns that had uh, thousands of iterations, if not like 10,000s of iterations. And I'd build them in spreadsheets, upload them to Meta through a third-party app, and then pull down the data, figure out the best combination of things, and then re-upload campaigns with like, the best combination of like creative, you know, images, uh, audiences, all that good stuff. At that time, it was really powerful. Meta does all that stuff today. Uh, So you don't need to do that. And it learns much faster and it's much smarter about it. So any, you know, performance media buyer, like effectively, they're just a really good creative strategist. And then they're a really good landing page CRO strategist, like conversion rate optimization strategist. So you look at the inputs you put into the machine, and then you look at how people uh, interact with your, your product pages, basically. That's it. Oh, gotcha. And so okay. we've had to completely change our teams to be like more creative strategists and then landing page CRO strategists. Like in terms of like okay. managing the campaigns, I mean, we're not doing a whole lot. We're just using okay. these kind of machine learning, uh, uh, you know, campaigns. And those are significantly more effective than the campaigns we can build ourselves. Right. So. Yeah, they're interesting. Yeah, that that definitely has changed the game a bit. And I, I, I can understand where you're coming from um, as far as the creative aspect of it. There's definitely have to be a focus on that, getting eyeballs on it and then getting people to convert once they've come through and, and then going to the landing page. I, I can I definitely understand um, how that's the major focus right now. Speaking of campaigns and and the focus of the results of these campaigns, key performance indicators do you guys usually prioritize when you're, you know, assessing the effectiveness of any ad campaigns that you're doing for your clients? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Cause I I love this because we're very uh, metric focused. We're very data focused. So uh, the way I look at this is, is we have a model of the customer journey from when they first see an ad to when they make a purchase, right? Okay. And we have a metric for each uh, area where I, I call them like friction points. And so you have two types of friction. You have psychological friction, and then you have like what's called like technical friction, I guess, right? Mm-hmm. So psychological friction is an example would be, is this ad convincing enough to make you wanna click on the ad, right? If it's not convincing, you have friction there, they're not gonna click on the ad, they go away. And then a technical friction might be the landing page takes too long to load. And so they, you know, you have a high bounce rate, right? And so what we do is we try to figure out all these friction points. So we have what are called like the hook rate of a video, right? And so that the metric is like, you know, three second view over impressions. Okay. So we have that first. It's like, did the ad stop the user from scrolling? Right. And that's the first metric we look at. And then it's like ad click through rate or like the view through rate of an ad. Uh, when someone clicks on the ad, Uh, Then, you know, they go to the landing page. We have like, you know, landing page view rate, right? Which is clicks to the actual page views. Uh, And then we have like, you know, landing page conversion rate. And then we look at the average order value. Uh, Any kind of, you know, any of those key metrics we look at, um, there's also lots of other kind of sub metrics. And so like these big ones and then the other ones that kind of sit between big ones again. And what we do when we we start working with a, a client is we go and we model this out. 
It's like, this is the ideal scenario that would get you maybe a return of ad spend of like 5X, right? Mm -hmm. And then we take all the metrics they have today and we compare them side by side. And what we look for is the biggest discrepancy. So, you know, it's like your, your kind of ideal click-through rate today is 1.2%, but your click-through mm -hmm. rate currently on your ads is 0.4%. So what we'll focus on immediately is like how to improve the click-through rates of your ads. And we'll kind of go down the line of this model and get all those metrics to the kind of the projected one where it would be most ideal. And that's all we do. And so we're figuring out that area where the, there's the biggest difference. We uh, run a lot of tests around that. We optimize for it. And then we solve that. We get it closer to the ideal one. And then we just, mm -hmm. you know, keep working on it. Like, okay. And so, yeah, but I would say the main things are uh, hook rate, click-through rate, uh, landing page view rates, landing page conversion rates, AOV. That's what we're looking at most of the time. So Okay, good stuff, good stuff. So, yeah, it sounds like, um, you know, other e-commerce uh, brand owners that are listening can definitely follow suit and, and, and follow those same uh, metrics just kind of as a, as a good rule of, of thumb. I know when you're, when you're doing all these things and you're working with your – um, customers, because you're, you're dealing with multiple campaigns that you're running over time. You guys are seeing a lot of the changing patterns with regards to consumer behavior. And that's one thing, of course, it's, you, of course, you're not control. You, we have no control over certain things over time. Consumers are more receptive to certain types of ads. But then, you know, that's that's always going to be changing. So I wanted to see, could you share an example of um, how you guys have had to shift your your advertising strategy based on meeting changing consumer preferences. Yeah, God, that's the uh, it's so tough um, because I mean that's most our, like why I think agencies are still in business is because uh, there's so much change that happens with consumers and then these ad platforms and you just have to constantly be ahead of it and then like watching those trends and then adjusting for it. So on the consumer side. Uh, let me think, uh, there's, let's say, let's see here. Uh, okay. One kind of very obvious one, but it, you know, it's very trendy in the last couple of years is, uh, user generated content. Right. And yeah. so mm -hmm. instead of having like a really well polished ad, you basically have someone with an iPhone speaking direct to the phone. Um, we've invested in that a lot in, in, in our creative strategy. And, and what I found is the reason uh, it's actually effective is for two uh, two things. One, uh, all of our you know social platforms we use today, uh, it, it's basically people speaking to videos, right? That's what TikTok yeah. is. That's what Instagram mm -hmm. is. And so when you're serving an ad in someone's feed, you want it to fit the native context, right? And so that's why UGC content works really well for ads. The other thing I think is really important here is like authenticity, right? And so uh, that there are a couple kind of sub pieces to that. One is, you know, when it seems like, and, and it's actually hard to do UGC uh, uh, like with real authenticity. A lot of times the ads kind of come off as fake and it's pretty obvious, <laughs> right. but right, you know, right. you see it and it's like, oh, this is somebody just like me who has the same problems I do and then solve those problems using this product, right? Uh, oh, that's kind of what you want to do. And then you have to think about who you're using for those actors too, to make sure that actor kind of matches your customer profile. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's just an example where, you know, I would say there's a time on social media where you could kind of throw anything out there and it worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> it evolved quickly to like all these platforms are now video first platforms. So UGC content became the best way to deliver messaging because it fit the native content. And then it became, you know, I would say it became very saturated and then it lost a sense of authenticity. And then you had to figure out like new tactical things to make those UGC videos more authentic. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. And um, I'm thinking of an example of, I had somebody else on a previous podcast and I was telling them, yeah, the user generated content is, is, is huge now. And I think what a lot of brands now are doing with on Instagram and some of the other platforms with these short kind of real style clips um, they're using there, they may be, real customer testimonials but what i'm starting to see is a trend where they look like a customer testimonial but it's not really a customer they're yeah. little the actors like i said these brands have to be very careful on who they select because some of these actors seem a little too polished and they don't seem like a real customer i, I just yeah. saw one the other day telling someone it's um it was a uh, a type of solid cologne for men where you kind of rub it on it's kind of like an oil-based type cologne 
And when I first saw it, I was like, oh, okay, you know, seems interesting. The guy telling the story about it and how, you know, the women around him were so receptive to it. He seemed just way too polished. It would just yeah, seem yeah. like just like their average person just trying it. So I was like, yeah, is this guy an actor? Is he really a customer? It was it was one of those things where you couldn't tell. And I think that's where brands have to be. They have to be very careful with if they're going to go that route, because, you know, these days, most people are, are pretty savvy. And if it's something too fake or an obvious actor, you know, it's uh, it's not going to come off as, as genuine as it as it really should. Um, yeah, that's. So that would really uh, cause problems. Like, yeah. like towing that line of authenticity is always extremely difficult. Um, but yeah. if you do it wrong, it, it yeah it does not work, right? So, yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. Um, well, Hal, as we get ready to, to wrap things up, but looking ahead at different emerging trends and technologies, we've talked about AI, we've talked about what's going to happen with the data. Privacy is a lot of changes kind of on the horizon. Do you believe, um, what are some of these trends that you think are going to really have the biggest impact on on div- digital advertising and, and how has your firm kind of prepared to adjust with these uh, changes? Yeah, so I think creative, generative, creative, uh, you know, generative AI for creative is, is probably yeah. going to have the biggest impact because, you know, Got as it. I mentioned before, like we, we change our like services around making the inputs, right? Like getting really good creative, testing a lot of creative, being very smart about how we research that creative and then put it into these ad platforms. Well, yeah. uh, Meta is already doing this where they have generative AI that they're creating themselves and then testing it. Uh, and so as that gets better, and I've talked to a, a couple of different software companies that are building out like really interesting, really good generative AI uh, ads, right? And they, they, they do UGC ads. And so it's wild because it's like a, an actor, it's a person, and they can kind of say anything or do anything, and they completely mm-hmm. can change the ad. So that's going to get really interesting. But I think the kind of, for me, it, this is a, a really interesting concept here. So when we test ads, we have a bunch of ideas, and we throw them into a campaign. And then we see which ads are generally doing best. We pull mm-hmm. those out, and we build iterations off of them, and we throw them back in, and they get incrementally better over time. The only issue is uh, there's uh, time, there's time and cost with that, right? So if you're going to go make a new ad or a new iteration, you have to get back to the creative team. They have to analyze it. They have to rebuild it and they go put it back in the ad platform. That is like, you know, it can take a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. With yeah. generative AI that's plugged into these ad platforms, they can learn and iterate in real time. Oh, so wow. all of a sudden you can have this kind of super ad that they learn to develop in like hours. And so I, you know, potentially if, if it's done right and it's authentic enough and it's believable enough that like you could have, like, I would see it as like, kind of like these quote unquote, like super ads that just, they learn super quick. Like what is the best ad to serve to you? And it's like radically more effective because effectively like, you know, digital advertising is, is pretty inefficient. Like you have people kind of guessing what they think is going to be effective for a target audience and you can kind of test it and refine it, but that takes a long period of time. But all of a sudden, with these machine learning platforms, they could like immediately create that perfect video for somebody and, and drive a much better action and, and do it significantly more efficiently. Right. And I, I see that as, as pretty wild and I see that as a future. Yeah. And then I won't have a job and I probably won't be doing more podcasts. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah. We, we hope that doesn't happen too soon. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. that is some pretty crazy stuff. I, I think one of the things also, I guess, that can be done with it is you would be able with these platforms, you know, adopting that type of technology, they'll be able to really have countless um, iterations of the same yeah. ad distributed to different people based on that person's likes and interests. And yeah. so let's let's use that, um, you know, the clone as an example. Um, I'm, I'm looking at it one day and I may see, you know, a certain type of actor in a certain scenario describing a certain uh, story you pull it up on your end because you have different preferences. You may see a totally different actor, yeah, uh, yeah. something totally different. And all of that is just generated just on the fly, which is, wow, that's, that's some crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, unfortunately it looks like we are headed that way is the question is just how soon are some of these things going to be, you know, released? Um, I guess this is the big question. Yeah. And I, I see it as being sooner than you think because of how, you know, the more scale that these platforms have, the more users they have, the more data they're collecting, the faster they'll learn on on what to do. Um, And so, but that actually goes back to the kind of the data privacy question, because if there are 
better regulation around what these platforms can collect about you, it could limit yeah. somewhat how quickly these platforms learn about you to serve these types of ads. True. But yeah. you know, we'll see. I mean, like TikTok's content delivery algorithms are insane. You can, mm -hmm. you'll watch a couple of videos and then it knows almost exactly what type of content you like to see. And yeah. then all of a sudden you're on it for an hour and you had no clue you spent that much time <laughs> on it. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. 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 But I've seen that with a lot of the platforms, you know, it's, it's in behind the scenes that that data that is capturing on, you know, how long you're viewing on it, what are you liking on that particular video or that reel? And then after that, it's, uh, it's off to the races. They're going to start serving yeah. you things based on what you're responsive to. And then, you know, fortunately you can kind of get sucked into a rabbit hole of, yeah. <laughs> of you know, watching these things. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's pretty cool stuff, but at the same time, it's kind of a little scary <laughs> to see the direction we're going with some of this stuff. But uh, you know, I guess yeah. time will tell. I guess my biggest thing is, you know, in terms of consumer interest, or really just you know, people is uh, I think there should be pretty serious guardrails yeah. uh, for political advertisers to go into that because, like, you can imagine yeah. a bad a bad actor having that type of leverage. Uh, it's not a good, <laughs> not good. Yeah. Right. So not, yeah, not, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. We have this up, up, upcoming presidential election. And so we'll see, we'll see where this goes with that. And I'll definitely kind of keep an eye out on some of the different ads that I'm getting and just see yeah. kind of where this technology is going, but, uh, going to be interesting if we don't see it in this election, I'd say definitely, um, within the next, the next one, um, this stuff is going to be. A, a lot more advanced. And so it's going to be interesting yeah. to see uh, how they've adopted it for that type, for those type of campaigns. Um, well, Hal, this has been an awesome conversation. I could definitely continue to talk to you about digital advertising for, for, uh, for a lot longer because there's so much going on these days with it. Um, but yeah, you've definitely brought a lot to the table. This has been a great conversation. And I know our, our listeners and viewers have been uh, empowered with what you've said. Um, but lastly, before we do let you go, I always like to close things out with a um, closing fun fact about yourself that uh, if you don't mind sharing that you think we'd be interested to know. Uh, fun fact. It's a good question. Uh, but I, this is completely random, but we'll just go with this. Uh, as a kid, we had a childhood pet that was a peacock. So, okay. Um, wow. Yeah. That's <laughs> okay. Very, very random fun fact. But uh, <laughs> gotcha. The other wild thing about it is it showed up at our house randomly and it stayed yep. with us for about 10 years and then it left. Wow. And oh, we wow. never, we didn't know where it went. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty crazy. That's yeah. very random. <laughs> wow. So where did you live at the time? Uh, at, so at, uh, Lexington, Virginia. It's a small okay. town in, in, in Virginia. So it's like kind of the southwestern part of Virginia. So Okay. Yeah. I was wondering. Yeah. Was, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. Because I'm in, I'm in Orlando, Florida. And I see peacocks yeah. where I am. I'm well, in a suburb of, of Orlando. And actually, I saw some last Saturday in yeah. a little area. That's interesting. So it just wandered into your guys' property. Um, and then you guys became, it became a pet of yours for 10 years and yeah. then it just disappeared after that. Yep. Yep. Fed it, wow. fed it dog food. So. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. And it just kind of so. stayed around, kept coming back and, uh, just all of a sudden just said, all right, it's time for me to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Well, yeah. that's definitely an interesting, fun fact. Thank you for sharing that, Hal. Yeah, yeah. Um, but lastly, uh, before we do let you go. Um, if you don't mind letting our listeners and viewers know the best way for them to reach you, if uh, they want to reach out to you and pick your brain any more about digital advertising. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the best place is, is probably LinkedIn message. Uh, I'm Hal okay. Smith. And then if you want to look up Hal Smith and then H Street, you'll probably find me. And I'm also on Twitter and it's Hal, the number four uh, ads. So Hal four ads. Uh, okay. Not that active on Twitter, more active on LinkedIn, but just shoot me a message on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place to reach me. Okay, great, great. We'll definitely uh, uh, have the sh for of course the show notes to your to your agency in the in the show notes of the podcast, and then we'll also encourage people to reach out to you on LinkedIn. Um, awesome. All right, uh, Hal, it's been awesome talking to you. We really appreciate having you on the e-commerce marketing podcast. Likewise, Arlen. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the e-commerce marketing podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share it with everyone you know. Are you looking to take your digital marketing to the next level but are tired of weeding through countless YouTube videos with unproven and untrusted marketing strategies? Well, we have the answer for you. The More Sales Every Month Online Digital Marketing Course. 
In this information-packed course, you will learn effective keyword research, link building, content marketing, and much more to attract and convert your site visitors into paying customers. Just go to moresaleseverymonth.com and sign up today for a low one-time fee. In addition to this power-packed course, if you would like to get access to a growing repository of digital marketing articles, PDFs, and eBooks, check out getosi.com resources and opt in to get full access to our library of priceless marketing information to help you take your digital marketing to the next level.